Hi, everyone. From me, Brent Graham of Good for the Game. It's Thursday night, 9 o'clock. It's time for our regular edition of the Handicap Rugby Chat That Matters. Bit of a double header tonight. We normally do Super Rugby in a separate show, but due to my schedule, we've had to cram it into one show, and we're going to be splitting it into two parts. We'll be starting off with URC Week 12 and then moving on to Super Rugby Week 5. I've got two guests joining me. One, I understand, has fallen asleep on the couch. I had to wake him up now before the show. It's Oracle. He'll be in in a second. And then we got the Moss Man joining us later on to discuss Super Rugby. That, of course, starts uh, pretty shortly in the morning, in fact, in South African time. Well, let's uh, bring me in here, trying a new uh, background thing. Let's see how it goes. Um, my Wi-Fi previously has given a few problems on this, but we'll see We'll see how it goes. Let me know your, your th thoughts on that. And I will uh, just talk a little bit about my betting weekend last week before the Oracle came in. I had one of those weekends as a punter, which you absolutely dread. You've got no one but yourself to blame, I must tell you. And I started off very well, started slipping in, and then played some, well, I can only describe them as crazy bets uh, towards the end. So I'm, I'm very much taking a bit of a layoff this weekend. I will be having a few small punts and a couple of acres here or there. But, yeah, I'm licking my wounds a little bit. And the best thing I can tell you in that situation is to take a bit of a break. But we've got the man himself coming in now, Oracle. You look like you've, you've got a bit of sleep sand in the eyes there, Oracle. Did you fall asleep on the couch by any chance? I did. <laughs> I did, Brent. It was a public holiday today. Human rights day. It's beautiful. Let people, uh, eat, let humans have their own rights and sleep if they want to. So, yes, you, you are correct. You, you, oh, you phoned me a minute ago and I, I put an alarm on and I see I didn't hear it. So, that's my fault. Um, but, yes, I always wanted to be on the show and here I am. So, yeah, no, ready to go. I'll tell you, the only reason I called you was because... Obviously, I WhatsApp you the link, and I, I, you know, normally I get the two blue ticks, and I know you've seen it. And this was about two minutes before the show, and I'm thinking, hell, this guy hasn't written a message yet. I better give him a call. So, uh, yeah, that, that's the that's the reason. Uh, good to have you on. Though, first of all, let me just say, you may have lost a case of beer to me last week because France got over 26 points, but it's, ultimately, you were you were spot on last week. You won Italy. Your best bet was Italy to win the game outright against Wales. You were spot on there, and I mean. If anyone watched our bet on the France-England game, they'd be mistaken for thinking I had a great weekend and you had a poor one. When in actual fact, you were on England on the plus as well. And I did everything wrong. I should have chosen France points as my main bet. Instead, I went on the handicap. It was a bit of a shocker. So no doubt you're in pretty good spirits going into this weekend. Yeah, Brent, I actually... Um, I, I messaged you to, um, to see if you were okay. And I didn't even know, I mean, I didn't have massive bets last week, yes, but I got everything right. I mean, everything right would have been England winning the game and um, Scotland winning the game. Obviously, that didn't happen, but it doesn't matter. And you sent me a message and you said, you know, you lost, and, uh, you, you lost X Rand and you won a case of beers. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I should just leave this like alone because uh, he's got a little bit uh, smashed here and I haven't. But... Um, everyone I've spoken to this week, they've said to me, what did you think of the rugby? And I'm going, well, it almost met, went my way. I, I got what I thought was going to happen. I just, you know, it didn't, it was in like an 85% week. And unfortunately, I didn't have enough on those Italians and uh, didn't have enough on the Scots. Plus, I had more on the board. It was a good week. Yeah, I can't complain. I mean, it was it was a good week. I won money. I'm happy. Good week. Oh, well, here's a nice surprise for us. We, he was going to join later on the show, but I'm guessing he's dropped his child off at school nice and early. So he's going to join us for URC as well. And it's uh, welcome to the Moss Man. Nathan, great to have you on the show, mate. Hey, thanks. Yeah, no, I managed to delegate that task. <laughs> uh, excellent, excellent. Well, I know you were saying last week you'd like to be on the show with Oracle sometime, so I decided to waste no time on that. Let the two of you guys meet. Oracle, uh, that's the Moss Man down below. Yeah, good to meet Mr. you. Yeah, if, um, Mr. Mr. Moss Man, I'm familiar. not surprised you want to meet me. Everyone wants to meet me, so don't feel bad there. Um, uh, I don't feel uh, bad. <laughs> however, I will say this. There's only a select few that I actually bother meeting, and you're one of them. So you're in the, you're in the club. Don't worry. I'm happy. I'll take that. Thank you. <laughs> no shortage of confidence from the Oracle there. You can see back in. Bre I promise you. I promise you, my wife says to me, you're overconfident. What's your problem? I said, well, I wake up in the morning. I'm happy. It's going to go my way. She goes, but it doesn't always. It doesn't matter. I expect it to. 
And she gets irritated with me when I'm like happy and things are going my way. I said, well, I expect them to. So that's how it is. So yes, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, you too. There yeah, you go, Mark. You all want to meet Doric, correct? Yeah, and Debbie. Why didn't you ask Harik? Why didn't you ask Harik, who finally did meet me? Because he was surprised, right? Eh? He thought he'd meet this arrogant, out of control, dodgy dude. And he was like, at the end of the night, he said to me, Gavin, I'm telling you, this is this has been a good night. And Ari and uh, Henrik's welcome to put in the comments. But I tell you what, he arrived there. He was like, is this who you are? I mean, I thought you were worse than this. Or I thought you were like, yeah, whatever. So, yes, I'm a good guy. Don't worry. I'm happy. Okay, good. <laughs> good to know, Ari. Mark Dunphy, well, Mark, when you do eventually get out to South Africa, to watch Ireland uh, in the years to come. We'll certainly introduce you to the Oracle there. But, gents, we've got quite a few games to cover tonight because a bit of a double header. We want to do URC as well as Super Rugby. I was going to start with, with URC, but I think um, we may as well get cracking with Super Rugby. We'll, we'll sort of go in order of, of, of how the games are going to go. And, uh, Nathan, I'll bring you straight in. We've got the opening game. We've got a big handicap. Hurricanes minus 17.5 against the Rebels and a point sign of 60.5. I kept this game using my gut feel method at 18 and a half. So really not a lot in this one for me. What do you spot here? I, I think um, all the handicaps that I've seen have been kind of around the right mark. I think if you're looking at this as a full strength Hurricanes team, they made 14 changes to the starting lineup. You know, And I, I think in general, when you do that, you you are kind of opening yourself up to a bit of a scratchy performance, you know, not a lot of combinations, all those sorts of things. So this game's in, in Palmy and... Uh, for whatever reason, a lot of the games that they play in the regions quite often turn to turn into sort of shootout style games. There was a game here last last year, I think against the Force, which you know racked up some crazy score. I think the Force had a, some backdoor cover with with two tries in the last few minutes. So I think it'll be high scoring. So I think the the first thing is I think the points will go over, and then I think if you like the Rebels, I think maybe the way to get at this might be Rebels over twenty and a half. Because, um, as I said, I, I think, you know, 14 changes to the starting lineup. Uh, I suspect it'll be a slightly disjointed kind of performance from the from the Hurricanes. Right. Now, Gav, I'm going to bring you in here. I did say to you we'd start with USC because I know you haven't done too much on Super Rugby. Are you happy to sort of just uh, come along and uh, for the odd comment? Or do you want us to actually start with USC? Have you got plans to that? Brent, <laughs> I'm happy. And I remember the... I remember the Friday mornings and Friday nights in the 90s and early 2000s um, when we'd go to, you know, we'd be at work on Friday and somebody would be like, where's the TV? Let's put it on. And one of the guys at work this week says to me, he saw like uh, Fiji playing somebody on the TV and he was like, what's this? Oh, it's super rugby. And I was a bit puzzled. But yes, he's right. And, and I suspect a lot of South Africans are like that as they – you know, they're putting the TV on a Friday morning, Friday afternoon even, even Saturday morning for that matter, and going, what's this rugby on TV here? And, you know, when you see minus 17 hurricanes against Rebels, and you think to yourself, this is, you know, a little out, because I'll tell you, I, I, the, the, the handicap that sticks in my mind forever is the Hurricanes-Lions uh, game of 20, I don't know if it was 2016 or 2017, I have to apologize was our Lions' first uh, final over there when it rained and they won um, 23 or 17-3. It wasn't that much. It was 14 or 12 or 13 or whatever it was. can't remember, but we didn't have that much. And like, this Rebels team looks like it's out of depth, but at the same time, in the in the old days, you would have thought the Hurricanes would have, you know, shat in at, at 17 and a half, but you don't know anymore. This, I, honestly, I've not followed this tournament enough to give anybody confidence. Jeez, this looks high, but at the same time, it looks like it's not even enough by a long way. So I don't know. Uh, I watched a couple of games last weekend, but this game, I can't I can't give you any confidence. And I'll tell you, half, half of South African rugby public doesn't even know this game's going on. Now, fair enough, although the punting public certainly do. And so what I'm going to ask you to do, Gab, we'll run through the Super Rugby with Nathan. If you've got anything to add, just raise a hand and I'll, I'll bring you in there, um, if you don't mind sitting, and then we'll we'll get on to the URC. So, Nathan, first of all, I just want to say to you, yeah, I really like that Rebels over 20.5. I think it's a nice way of approaching the game. Similar views to you. As I say, I was looking at it and going, this is exactly where I handicapped it 
So I like it because I also think the Rebels are a side that have got points in them this season. They only scored three in their opener, but since then they've quite impressed me with their attacking play. And particularly if they fall, it's one of those bets they could get 30 points behind and then the Hurricanes step off the gas and the, and the Rebels get a chance at some point. So very much aligned with you on that one. Let's move on to the next game. Here we got the Brumbies, minus 14 and a half against Moana Pacifica and a points line of 60.5. Yeah, Moana are one of the teams that don't have a great read on this year. And I think what happens when you're modeling uh, games in, in the way that I am is that you you have a rating system or probably a variety of different rating systems. And you're always trying to find a balance between them adjusting too quickly and adjusting too slowly. So, you know, when they, if, if they adjust too quickly, you'll, you'll say, okay, whoever won by the most points last week, that's clearly the best team. Like that's an exaggerated scenario, but that's, that's literally how it would work. And then the flip side is you'd say, well, the Crusaders have won the last six titles in the row, so they must be the flips, you know, they must be the best team. So, you know, that's the other end of the spectrum where you're not moving enough. And I, I think what's happening with Moana is, is I suspect they are better this year and maybe, you know, quite considerably better. And again, my ratings maybe just aren't reflecting that because my numbers are telling me Brumbies here, but I, I just don't have a lot of confidence in that. Um, Brumbies have made a few changes as well. Um, <clears throat> and as I just don't have a great read on Moana. So I think this is a game I'd probably stay away from. If I was, you know, if was a bet, it would be on the Brumbies. Uh, and I think the points line is probably exactly where, where it should be. Right, let's go on to the next game. Drew up against the Waratahs. I know there's been lots of rain this week. Uh, let me bring Oracle in there. We almost got through a game without you there. Gav, what's up? No, I'll uh, I'll chuck in my two cents worth in each game, Brent. Um, so okay. he's right. Um I, you, this is a, this um, Samoa team, Mano Pacifica, you, you don't know what you're going to get. It's like that uh, a dude with the chocolates. What is his name in the, in the movie? He's going to open the box. Forrest of chocolates. Yeah, Forrest Gump, correct. You don't know what you're going to get. But the results, the last two couple of results have been, well, three, two of the last three. I mean, they've beaten... The force and well, actually, you have to go a few weeks back to um, them having to be beat, uh, have them beating the Waratahs. And you say to yourself, "Geez, this isn't bad." I mean, I know my kid; he's a he's a Fiji supporter, and he knows every Fijian player. And he knows a lot of the island players, but yet he's in sort of 85, 80 percent um, Fiji's playing. He knows all of them, and he loves the sevens and all of that. And every single Saturday and Friday morning, if he's at home with me. He switches the TV on. He's watching these games, and I must say that these two teams, the the Samoa and the and the Fiji team, have brought so much to this competition that they're the big winners. And everyone talks about URC and who the big winners on URC, and it's clearly been Ireland and South Africa for that matter, but more Ireland than South Africa. And I think in this tournament, Fiji and Samoa, their teams have been fantastic, and it'd be really nice to get a, a Tongan team or even a. Um, what are those other guys called? Um, uh, anyway, I'll the, remember uh, in a bit. the Jaguars will be they're coming back apparently. No, 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 I'm actually talking about more the island teams that are, um, not new way. And uh, there's another one, um, oh, where, you're, getting, where you're, you're getting pretty small down there. Are we lucky, yes, no, but we're right, we're right, right, it's quite big, big, but they don't have <laughs> they don't have enough to you know probably run two or three teams, but. If they had to recall a whole lot of New Zealanders, I mean, we remember that game a couple of years ago when Tonga played and um, the coach put out a broadcast in New Zealand saying, hey, we're playing a game. If you're not doing anything, come around and, and play. And, uh, you know, you got a whole lot of people and the handicap was supposed to be about 15. It was like 45 or whatever it is. But the reality is in New Zealand, there's a lot of people that are playing rugby that aren't from New Zealand or have, um, you know, family ties out there. And it would be nice to get a, a couple of other teams because I honestly think this tournament's on its way to um, not the significance that it used to be. Um, that's, I'm not, I'm not being rude or anything. It's just, that's how I feel. I don't wake up in the morning on Friday and Saturday and open it up, but I'm encouraged to see the Fijis and the Samoan teams doing well. And, you know, this is... This is a big handicap for a team that's won a couple of games. And the other problem is here, and 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 you might feel, um, I don't know, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for, but I don't know where they're playing. 
it's very irritating that I don't know if this game is in Canberra. It could be in, in, in – well, let me put it this way. It should be in Canberra, but I don't know it's in Canberra. And a lot of people don't know that either until we turn the TV on and see it. But Why I'm going to tell you – Why you the second round in Melbourne or something? No. Where do they play at home? Are they playing all their games at home, the Pacific no, yeah, team? Yeah, but remember, they... they're away, they're away here, so – Obviously, they, they, they will be... In they Canada. are away, yeah. yes. But I don't know if Brumbies are playing all of their games there. Just I'm just saying that's the perception yes. I'm getting. So I might be the only person, sure. It just doesn't feel like it's always going to be in Canberra or it's always going to be in Perth or it's always going to be in Sydney. It's almost like the competition can go out there and you know, tell us a little bit more. Um, but, yeah, I'm on the plus here. Uh, there's enough results for this uh, Pacifica team to tell me they can win this game. So I'll have a little bit on the board, and I'll definitely have some on the plus. Nothing for Brumbies telling me that they're going to smash this team. There isn't. But it's very small for me right now. Okay, I think, I'll go back I think to Nathan. Have we got the Brewer here, Nathan, yes. up against the Waratahs. A low points line here. I didn't double-check all the bookies. I mean, it looks really low. I know there's been a lot of rain, and I know we always had a low-scoring game against Crusaders. There's plenty of humidity there in Fiji. But, wow, this points line does look low, unless the weather's really shocking. And we got the Drua here, favourites of four and a half. And Nathan, I'll tell you up front, I actually thought this this handicap I got totally wrong when I capped it because I thought the Waratahs would actually start narrow favourites. What are you? What are your numbers throwing out at you here? Yeah, I was just going to um, say it's interesting though that the comment about where the games are played. I think maybe there was a period during the COVID years that probably gave you yes. that perception because there were all sorts of different rules um, and you, between New Zealand and Australia or even between Australian states and you had Australian teams playing in random locations because for whatever reason they couldn't leave their state or once they'd leave their state they couldn't get back in so the, you know the Rebels obviously based in Melbourne were playing mainly in New South Wales the Drill were playing in Queensland like there was all sorts of random stuff but it was just like a necessity of the of the time um, and it's interesting uh, we're talking about different competitions and I guess the perception of especially the betting public, but um, it, it kind of makes me laugh because I do see people um, in, in the forums and online and all these sorts of things, and they're kind of you know trashing the standard of Super Rugby, and then literally the week after I'll see them like just complaining bitterly about the standard of URC, like they can't believe how bad these Welsh teams are. Oh, the standard of these South African teams, like because you know they're they're putting up crap performances as well, like you know, and the thing is that people just forget that. In any competition, and it doesn't matter if it's the Premier League, you know, soccer, doesn't matter if it's the NFL, NBA, you name it, like they're going to be games that are just rubbish because the teams, you know, they don't put it together on the night, they don't care, or maybe they're just the bottom of the barrel in the league, right? So, and, and it just, as I said, it's like it's usually betters who've, you know, bet the over and then get really angry, you know, when the, the teams can't put it together. It's like, look, you, no one's forcing you to put your money on these teams. You got it wrong. You know, the teams didn't get it wrong. The ref didn't. Don't blame the ref. You got it wrong. You know, it's your read. It's your money. You decide where to put it. And I think just quickly before we go into the drill game, you said don't blame the ref, and I saw Oracle nod there. It gave, I mean, that's something that you've always said. You know, the ref, everything evens out over time. Don't blame the ref. And uh, and I'm sure you like what uh, what Nathan had, had to say there. I have to say, Brent, um, I used to have a hashtag called uh, leave the ref alone or <laughs> the ref. I don't know what it was, but it was something like that. And in fact, one of my mates, and he's probably watching the show, he lives in, he lives in New Zealand. He's also a referee and he always, uh, he's on my Facebook and I don't go very often to Facebook, but um, he's, a, he's a fisherman and a referee. And, and I always see him commenting on his, on his posts, telling people to leave them alone. And absolutely, I've always said this. You'll love this one, Nathan. If you lost a bet, don't blame the referee. You picked the wrong side. Simple as that. Like, you can't get any more clearer than that. Um, yeah. But I'll tell you, Nathan, it's not about me, eh? Don't, don't, um, you know, I'm, I'm, Brent will tell you, I'm the kind of person, I'm going to, I'm going to say it how it looks or how it feels to me. So this is not a personal comment to uh, Super Rugby. I, I loved it. I mean, I used to get up. I, I remember working in Mozambique in the late 90s getting up at four o'clock in the morning to watch these games in the 98s and 99s. I don't, you know, it's not about me. I, I'm just saying that I've lost that, 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 um, uh, not, not will to get up in the morning on a Friday and Saturday, because obviously I do get up, but 
to watch the game and put some money on it because yes, the media are, are telling us differently and and also I'm going to use the water cooler and you know everyone talks about that but you get to the water cooler on a Friday morning and and people used to say who are you backing today? What's your Super Brew pick and all of this stuff? And I got to tell you I don't hear Super Rugby anymore. It's gone. It's just disappeared. And that just might be a uh, an arrogant South African thing. They're thinking, well, you know what, we've left and we, we're playing in Europe now. Um, but again, my son and I, it definitely on a Saturday morning, we watch the games. I don't know every play and I've never known every play. So it's not any different this time. Um, but I'm not as, I'm not as confident to put my money down as I used to be. I used to wake up in the morning and I used to know I'm going to put three, four, five units, two units on this game. Today, I'm thucking my, uh, thucking Sucking my thumb, not sucking my thumb. <laughs> my thumb. <laughs> sucking my thumb. Yes. I want to know what you. Yeah, I want to know what you fucking out of that glass over there. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, listen, you know, it's, yeah. No, it, look, it's different. It's different to what it used to be. It really is, and I don't know where what it is like with with you and and your water cooler and your friends and and the community around there. But I can tell you what, South Africans. They're not talking about New Zealand and Australia anymore. They're talking about the Irish. They're talking about the Welsh. And you're right. A lot of the time, these guys are uh, – one of the comments I've heard a lot of times is they don't respect us. They're sending half a team here. You know, they'll send half a team to Cape Town or Durban or Joburg, and people are going, like, why don't they send a full team like the Crusaders used to be, uh, you know, like the Waratahs used to do. And, you know, it's a long tournament. So, sure, they're not going to send every single person, and it's about winning every game. And not winning, not about every winning, and not about winning every game. It's about you know getting into the top eight and winning the tournament. Hmm. Yeah, look, and I think that's it's a hundred percent natural that as soon as a country doesn't have a, a, you know teams in a competition, that they're not going to be as interested in it. That I think that's completely understandable. Um, the thing that's interesting about Super Rugby, just purely from a betting perspective, and, and I've mentioned this um, on on the show before, but. Um, in terms of so pinnacle, which you know for me is kind of the, the gold standard in terms of a you know sharp book and, and kind of the market maker, um, still has double the liquidity, like in terms of the max stake that you can put on on Super Rugby as compared to those other competitions, which I just I just think is interesting. So it's clearly like just in terms of the the volume of bets and the and the, the amount of money that's getting down, uh, you know Super Rugby still obviously generating that interest somewhere. And, and I must say, Nathan, you know, to that point, first of all, agree with Gavin. It's no, I mean, I've, I've got mates who are not sports punters. They don't care about Super Rugby anymore. And I agree with you. I think it's totally natural because ultimately those are rugby supporters. They want to watch their team play. But I can tell you that there's still a tremendous following in South Africa from a betting point of view. Guys love Super Rugby from a betting point yeah. of view. And that probably goes some way towards sort of a verifying what you've just said now is that at the end of the day, from a punting point of view, it's still a hell of a popular tournament. And uh, I mean, I'm, I must say, yeah, it's one that I look I look forward to. I'm not looking forward to this weekend as much as other weekends because I've just been on a horror run. But uh, I've got to say, at the end of the day, I enjoy my Friday mornings and my Saturday mornings watching watching Super Rugby. And I guess, yeah, what's happening is 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 pretty natural and uh, really just as a result of South Africa leaving the tournament, I would imagine. But let's move on now to game number three. Uh, that we sorry, are one, one more question, Brett. This game yeah. is this game taking place in Fiji? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is this is in Fiji. Yeah. I'm going to say two things. That's fantastic and wonderful. And at the same time, I had no idea. Like there isn't anything that's going. Hey, this game's in Suva or this game's in Fiji. No one's telling me that, and I think that's massive. I mean, I remember when the Chiefs and Crusaders used to play a game there, trying to popularise the rugby that was obviously already popular but they're not making more of this it's just yeah i i didn't know i had no idea yeah i mean i, I do agree with gavin in the sense that it's great that it is taking place in pg and, and nathan the drew are a different side at home it's as simple as that when they play at home they're very very tough to beat would you say we would you say the bookies have got this handicap right or is there some value it's this is a tricky one and the reason why is, is just looking at that points line so they're they're predicting like huge amounts of rain it's kind of like monsoon conditions um there were you know landslides in the lead up like just it, it sounds like you know biblical style <laughs> rainfall coming down there so 
this um, this points line actually opened closer to sixty. Um, I took it at fifty seven and a half. So it gives you a, you know tells you everything you need to know about where it's gone from there. It was actually stuck in the kind of mid to high fifties kind of all week, and that that forty three just popped up in the last day or so, which is crazy that it took that long for people to kind of get onto this and get because. Um, it's almost one of these ones where I don't think um, when when they're pricing these that they they can go low enough in a way because <laughs> I mean if this the, it could be a swamp you know like this game could finish you know I don't know eight five or something who knows but um, the thing that's interesting then looking at the the actual um, the handicap line is that that hasn't changed so as the points have come down like in general what happens is as the points come down the favorite um, decreases as well um, because they are correlated. That hasn't happened here. Um, I was the same when I looked at this, kind of handicapped it in my head. I made it sort of like a pick'em game. I thought it would be sort of um, even money. So, um, but when I looked at the numbers, they were probably right around where this is. I, so, I, I, I think in a game like this, with the conditions the way they are, who knows what the hell's going to happen, right? Like, I mean, it could be you know almost sort of farcical. So, I think you'd almost you. You'd go Waratahs in the sense that if it's really just a crazy coin flip game because no one knows what's going to happen, then you you take the points. But um, th this is one of these ones where I think also you know if you depending on the options you've got at, at your various accounts, like just just looking maybe for something you know um, out of the ordinary, like in the prop market, like you know no team to score um, three unanswered tries, you know those sorts of things, and then maybe putting that in a bet builder with some unders, you could probably go. You know, unders for the unders for the half, unders for the the total. You know, there's probably some creative stuff you could do when you know that a game is going to be, you know, really a, a massive outlier like this one's probably going to be. Gabe, anything else for you on that one? Yeah, I was going to say a couple of things come up here. Um, Nathan's right. There's these games like this. I remember a, a Boylan game against the Bulls where um, the ground ground manager guy phoned me up and he was a he was a, I don't know, 200 rand punter. He goes, what's the handicap today? This is a Friday afternoon. I said to him, uh, boil until plus 26 and a half. He goes, uh, still 26 and a half. I said, yes. He says, give me three grand on that. I'll take three to 33. I said to him, okay, but you're a 500 rand punter. What's the story? He says, no, no, no. Said, Have I got a bet? I said, you got a bet. He says, I'm standing on the field. I can't see my feet. So, so it's always good to that. And as it happens, bull, bulls were minus 26. I straight away went minus 15, and uh, the whole country was at 26. Eventually, we all met at 18, and um, the uh, the Bulls won 10-5. So it was a five-point game. There were 15 total points in the game. But I've got to say this, though. Um, I'm going to ask the question, Nathan, actually, for the punters' benefit and myself. 43 is low, but it's not, it's not hurricane uh, low. I've seen 33s and 34s. So I'm going to ask you this question: Are the um, are the Fijian team not more likely to play in these conditions if what you're saying is correct? In other words, is there value in going over the uh, Drewers number, which would be uh, based on that probably 20, 23, 20 would be the points line, maybe 24, 20? Is it not uh, beneficial to go over on the 23 and maybe low on the game, or even for that matter, go low on Waratahs? Would they battle in this weather conditions? Because often I, I look at weather games. This is a weather bet. Let's not make uh, any five sides about this. There's two ways here. This is a weather bet. And uh, that's why as a bookmaker, I only open my points bets a couple of hours before the game and the guys can have whatever they want. I don't open them, you know, four, 14 monsoons ago kind of time to uh, really smash me. So as a punter and as a bookmaker, I'm, I'm the kind of person I'd like to, if I'm going to have a bet, it's going to be close to the game. But yeah, are, are the Drua more likely to score more than 24 points than the Waratahs scoring 20? Uh, and in other words, let, let's talk about points in the in the scenario of bad weather. Who's more likely, Drua to get more points or Waratahs not to get the points? Let's let's answer that question. And, and I think there's probably two competing things going on. So so one is the Drua being used to playing in conditions like this. Uh, I mean. If it's as bad as what they say, then almost no one's, you know, used to playing in conditions like this. But it's also going to be humid. Like it's going to be slippery balls. It's going to be all these sorts of things. So yes, Drew are probably more used to 
I guess, the, the, the overall climate. But on the flip side is that if this just becomes a 10-man, you know, rugby uh, ball up the jersey kind of game, and to be fair, I think that's what the Waratahs are expecting and what they're preparing for. Because I saw some comments from Jake Gordon um, uh, online. He was talking about we don't want to play draw ball. We don't want to get, you know, pulled into a game of basketball. Uh, we want to keep it tight. We want to do all these things. So if it becomes a bit of a set piece battle, then that's, that suits the Waratahs better. They're going to be better in the scrum, better in the line out, those sorts of things. Um, probably better, you know, tactically. So then you've got, as I said, two com- sort of competing things that, and, and I'm, when you're in that situation, like it, you, you can construct some sort of narrative and make a story around why one is more important than the other, but the truth is I don't know. <laughs> and I'd be surprised if anybody did, like, you know, um, you make up a story to suit yourself. So I would tend to probably, you know, stay away from some of those bets that were choosing one of those things over another, if that makes sense. And I just want to add something there, guys. Just just something I always think when you talk humidity, I think Durban, I think the Sharks. Mm. So you would think that the Sharks, when it's humid, you would think the Sharks would have an edge because they're used to the conditions. What I find <laughs> season after season is it's not the case. In mm. fact, I would argue that being based in humid Durban, the Sharks are perhaps just generally more drained than the other teams because the other teams get to go home to a different climate whereas the Sharks continually have this humidity. I mean, that's just a, a thingy. But... It, 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 it is an interesting point because you often say, oh, well, that team's used to the conditions. And then you look at the Sharks and you go, sure, but there's no team more used to playing in humid conditions. But they, they butcher it time again. But, of course, we're going to get a, an opportunity to talk about the Sharks later as well. Um, no, I was going to say, Brent, I actually remember driving to work in Durban, driving through roads that had, you know, when it was heavy rain, might have five to ten centimetres of water. And suddenly I'm driving through 30, 40 centimetres of water. And so Friday morning I'm going to work. And the guys are telling me sharks are minus six. I said, no, 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 no. You better bring this game closer to zero. Uh, I think we started at minus two. And uh, Free State won the game. It was the cheaters. They, they won the game by four. But also, it was like a 10-7 game or 13-8. Or, I don't even think there were 25 points in the game. But we, I knew that driving to work on Friday morning. I knew because of the water I was driving through, getting there, that it just wasn't going to happen. And, and as much as we rugby punters and fans want to see them throw the ball, they just keep dropping it because it's wet, it's slippery, you know, all of that shit's going to happen. So I'm going to say, I'm going to have a bet. And I've listened to what Nathan said. I've thought about these kind of games in the past. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to have a punt here. And I'm going to go under 20 and a half Waratahs. Or if it has to be 19 off, I'm going to go under 19 off. I don't think Waratahs score the points here. I don't care what the Drew score. My punt is Waratahs don't survive this. And and I'd like to say I'm going to be right. And you're going to invite me to the show next week. So I like this bet. I'm under Waratahs points here. Yeah. I don't care what happens. I don't care who wins. But I'm under Waratahs points in this game. Purely right. on what I've thought about and what I've seen in the past. In, in the interest of finishing the show before the kickoff of the Waratahs game, <laughs> we want to the next one and bring Nathan here. Nathan, we got Chiefs minus 14 and a half against the Highlanders and a points line here of 60.5. Yeah, I will try and keep this one short. Then. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I've taken the Highlanders at plus 15 and a half, but um, I still think it's good at this number. The, the Chiefs have made some rotations um, in the front row. They've pretty much got a whole new front row. The Highlanders are missing De Groot in their front row, who would normally be a big loss, but I think it's kind of offset by the fact that the Chiefs have, have gone with their second string. Um, Patch will back at 10. I think he makes a big difference. Um, Highlanders in general, I think, have taken a step forward. Um, I think it's just too big a cap, um, to be honest. Uh, and um, and, it's, and it's it's kind of a, a, a fixture that I know well because last year uh, I, I had taken a bet on the Highlanders and then it, it was literally like 10 minutes before the game. And I never do this. I just said, look, this is, I've got it wrong. Like, and, I, and, I, and I bet completely the other way. Um, and and I, I was right. My gut feeling in that time was right, um, even though I, you know, I just could have, didn't have a good read on those teams. Um, this year, I just I feel differently. The Chiefs have actually had a covered um, three out of four. Uh, so, yeah, I think the Chiefs have taken a while to, to get into their work, and the Highlanders are better. So long story short, um, on the Highlanders. Right on the Highlanders, there, Gav. Anything for you on that game? No, I'm going to listen to Nathan. I'm back in the Highlanders. Nothing. I'm not going to give you a second chance to rethink that. I'm going straight on to the next game, 
We've got the Blues here against the Crusaders. I handicapped this game. Blues minus nine and a half. That's where it is now, but it's not where it opened. It was actually minus five and a half Blues early in the week. But the money's definitely come for the home side here. And Nathan, we've got a points line of 51.5, which is, aside from the Drua game due to conditions, will be one of the low points lines of the weekend. Yeah, and, and I, I, I've got the points of 51, so there's, there's no play there. It's exactly where it should be. Uh, I took the Blues at six and a half, you know, and I can see online that there's um, a bit of resistance um, heading in the other direction around that nine and a half. And again, a lot of it is based on perhaps the Crusaders of old. People, I people, see people saying that, you know, they're not impressed by the Blues, but this is probably a good example of, um, you know, people who are looking at last week's score where the Blues only beat the Waratahs by two. There was a bit of a, a, a faulty final, like in terms of the scoreline. So if you actually watch that game, um, the Blues scrum was dominant. Like they absolutely bossed the Waratahs last week in the scrum. Uh, and they had two tries that were ruled out for really technical calls, you know, like somebody broke off a mall and was still attached, that kind of thing. Um, a, a clean out past a ruck, you know, so they weren't, they weren't kind of good pieces of defending. They were just sort of technical mistakes by the Blues. On top of that, you've got Perifeta, who I think kicked, you know, one out of six or something like that. Ooh, yeah. And again, you know, you've got people saying like, oh, well, you know, that means you can't trust them. And, and I just see it completely differently. I just think, you know, over the long term, that's an outlier. He'll regress back to where he should be, where he's been over his career. So, you know, that was a lot of points left on the table. Um, I was on the Blues. And, th and there's two types of losing bets, right? You know, like I so said, last week I was on the Blues, seven and a half. That was a loser. You know, and I looked at that and I said, well, would I make that bet again? And I would. I would make that bet again, you know, because I'm, I'm, it's not about what happened last week. It's the question you're asking yourself. If they play this game 100 times, would that result come up 55 out of 100 times? And I think it would, right? So, um, you know, I think I read it right. Um, I think it was probably just a little bit of bad luck. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to – well, sorry. I, I was happy to take the Blues at six and a half. This number is um, – now probably getting out past the point where I'd do it. So I would not play it at that number. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely not going to play the Crusaders back in, in the other direction. Not happy with your six and a half there. Yeah, I agree with agree with totally with what you said on that one. And unfortunately, I didn't take the early minus. So I'll have to give some thought as to what I throw into an accolade. Gav, you wanted to add something on this game? Yeah, so I just want to have a bit of a, a fun question to you, Nathan. Last week was 10-12 with a... Were they playing in Fiji with bad weather? <laughs> um, no. Yeah, you, no, no. It's nice just... to hear they weren't, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Crusaders are playing as bad as the Lions were in 20, 2010 when my my um, my, my 21 year old was seven years old and he, and he kept saying to me, When is this team going to win? He proudly wear, wears his Lion shirt, uh, Lion shirt, sorry, when he goes out on a Saturday with his girlfriend. And she's even got one. Um, and that's only because the uh, father doesn't know that much about rugby, so didn't educate her very well. But Dylan's been able to educate her. So, yes, there's a couple of them running around in line shirts. But, yeah, 2010, we used to lose every game. And you know, people, and he'd say to me, like, when are we going to win? When are we going to win? And I've got to tell you, the Crusaders must be shaving supporters here. They must be – I know what it's like in South Africa. You know, if your team doesn't win – and they keep losing and keep losing. Their wives are the first ones to go. They're going, hang on. You're like, why are you supporting this team anymore? And this Crusaders team, I saw a stat the other day, was their worst year. And I've got to say that I, I think I remember a worse one in the 90s where the Crusaders finished last or second last. I'd, I'd stand About to be 90, 95, 96. I think it was, it was the very first year. I don't think, rugby in 96. Yes, I don't think I remember it being quite bad. The, Hmm. It was like Super 10 or something. I don't, yeah. I've noticed that they don't seem to quote that. They seem to like only start the stats. <laughs> it's the Lions won the Super that. 10. That's why, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> they beat the Reds in the final. I remember that, mate. <laughs> yeah, it was but, Auckland um, Blues. They beat the Auckland Blues. I was actually, I was a waiter at uh, Joe Cools in Durban on the beach run. And we and uh, I served the, the Queensland team, the, the Reds team. And we actually had 4X uh, flown in from wherever it was. And we had it ready for them in the bar, but I don't know. I'd say half the people that were at the restaurant that night probably dead because it was so long ago. Um, but yes, I, I don't know what to do here. I look at this and I'll, you know, as, and, and I'm a maths punter, Nathan, most of the time. And I look at this and this tells me something's wrong here. And I know that most of the time it is wrong. Um, sorry, it's not wrong. And there's only a period of time that it isn't. So for a normal punter who, 
opens the page or turns on the TV and he sees minus nine and a half or his computer or whatever it is, this looks out. Eh? This looks badly wrong. Not even close to slightly wrong. This looks this looks wrong. But again, if you look at the season, you'll understand why this position is, you know, why the Crusaders are plus nine and a half. But I'd say 29 out of 30 times I'm going to go for the Crusaders. But after last week and the week before, I'm not. So this one, I'll just watch with a smile on my face. No, no bet for me. Right, John, nothing confident from us. On the current lines there, if you did manage to get onto the early minus, well, hang on to that one. Right, Nathan, at the final game of the weekend, we've got the force here, plus 11 and a half against the Reds, who for me have been by far the most impressive of the Australian sides. We've got a points line of 56.5. Anything jump out for you here? Yeah, I mean, one of the things actually last week, because last week was, a, I think, a tough week all around, um, you know, in Super Rugby anyway, you know, it was it was for me and, and I think it obviously was for you from what, I, from what I've read. Um, and uh, if you look actually across the board, people on forums and on Twitter and all the rest of it, like I think everybody took a bit of a kicking last week. So, um, you know, losing, having a losing week like that, you know, can, can go one of two ways. It's, you know, you can kind of get angry or, you know, do... do have some sort of emotional reaction um for me like i just sort of use it as an opportunity to go back and look at my process you know say did i miss something you know is this something that i can change um one of the things that i that i sort of looked at was teams that are uh, been sort of consistently on the wrong side of um and so i think one of the things that's happened is that the the reds have definitely taken a step forward and i talked about this you know when you've and again, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a data, you know, maths punter as well, um, looking at the Reds. The, the numbers have not caught up with how much improved the Reds are. And so, you know, I'm looking at my own numbers and I'm just not believing them because it's telling me that the force is the right side. And, you know, I, I tend to, I'll start with that number, layer, you know, my own kind of subjective opinions over the top of it. And I, I can't, I can't get near the force, I think, um, you know, the, the way things have gone so far this season. And... I've seen nine and a halfs um, kicking around on the reds. And even though it's going completely against my own numbers, um, I'm pretty tempted to actually get involved um, on the reds at nine and a half. Um, I think they're just a really different team this year than what they have been in the past. Um, and they've got a couple of players back um, this week. And it sounds like maybe the force, I uh, think from memory, um, don't have Nick White either, who was kind of like one of their marquee signings coming into the season. So, um, I can easily see that the Reds blowing the force out, I think, is the, the short answer here. Right, Gav, uh, you, you've got anything on the final Super Rugby game before we head into URC? Uh, you muted yourself, Gav. I said last week, I was quick to say, this is the, the, the obvious play here, is the force minus. Every time you give me a force minus in this situation, and they didn't even win the game. Wow. So, yeah, that was... Uh, I did my money on that one, um, so no. But I'm I'm smiling to see that Reds are minus 11 and a half. Yeah, Nathan's going, Reds are going to pump these oaks. So, yes, I'll follow Nathan here. Can I have a red punt? I'm happy. Yeah, find a better number than that 11 and a half. That's all, that's all I'd say. Yeah, go look around. In fact, he's a bookmaker. Oh, yeah, no, price up his own. Enough, yeah. Gav, you're a bookmaker. Price up your own line. Why not price up minus five and a half and see if the rest of us get on? <laughs> give me a no vig. Yeah, give me a no vig line. <laughs> no vig line, right. <laughs> I, I tell you what, when I, when I arrived at Marshall's World of Sport in 2005, South Africa, Sharks were playing uh, Crusaders and it was like, I think the whole world had minus, I think it's 18 or 19, I don't know. So I said, right, we'll go 15. And he goes, but you like, you know, five points out from the market. I said, I don't care. Uh, I like the Sharks here, and I think the punters will come for them. So I don't want to lay the Sharks. I want to lay the Crusaders. He says, yeah, but but everyone's 20. And, like, if you don't like them, go 19. Why are you going 15? I like 15. <laughs> and if Jeremy, Marshall's, if Jeremy Marshall's watching the TV now, you'll remember that moment. And the first punter was, like, his massive rugby punter. He phones and he goes, who's that? I said, it's Gavin. He says, you're doing the rugby? I said, yes. He said, I believe you got uh, – uh, minus uh, 15 and a half uh, Crusaders. I said, absolutely. How much do you like? He says, how much can I have? I said, what, are you making a deposit or are you only using what's in your account? The oak was blown away. I gave him maximum. And Jeremy calls me outside. He says, we don't operate like that. I said, well, I do. Yeah, you well, got I some... Tell you uh, that, 
you've got some gamble in you, not like uh, modern bookmakers. Yeah, no, the modern bookmaker is all about, uh, I mean, there's absolutely no gamble in the modern bookmaker, unfortunately. And that's one thing I do enjoy about certain bookmakers that still offer us that. But I can tell you, and we won't go into it on this show now, but yeah, Jeremy Marshall's got some stories that he's going to take right through life with him. But one of them involves a certain Jim Furyk in the, in the Net Bank Golf Challenge. But gents, let's get on to the URC. Uh, Nathan, are you under time pressure? Are you happy to stay for the URC chat? Or do you yeah, no, I'm good. Follow? I'm, okay, I'm great. Good. Well, let's start on Friday night, and I'm going to actually start with the Oracle this time. Um, I don't have points lines here, gents. I don't know if they are out yet. I sometimes have them at this stage, but I had a quick look. I couldn't find any. Um, we got the uh, Glasgow Warriors here, Gavin. They're big favourites, minus 16.5 against the Cardiff Blues. Uh, frankly, both Friday night games look a bit dangerous for me. Have you had a look at this one? Yes, the uh, the minus looks right to me, and, and and I'll tell you this straight up. I don't know how Nathan feels about this from a maths point of view as well. Is I my maximum minus bet is very much smaller than my maximum plus bet, and it's not by design. It's just how I've noticed life over the last ten to fifteen years. When I go, you know, let's have a, have a proper go here. Uh, if it's sixteen and a half. Um, I might go, sorry, let me put it this way. If it's plus 16 off, I might go five units if I really like it. But a minus 16 off, even though I might really, really fancy it, it couldn't be more than like a three. I'm just, mentally, I know that pluses arrive more than minuses and it's not t tournament specific. It's more just the world of rugby betting. And as much as I like this minus, it's, it's not a big bet. It's a small two-unit bet. Um, I think it's the right way to go. It just feels like that. And also that oh, between 15 and 20, it's got a mental side of it as well. You know, 21, um, you know, if I think a team's going to win by 30, I'll take a 21, even a 25. 16, 15, 16, 17, 18 is that line, that sort of range where uh, I'd never go big. It's it's a tough one. I mean, we saw last week with Ireland and, and everybody asked me what I thought. And I said, listen, Ireland not winning this game by 16. And, and a lot of it is mental. I've seen it. I've seen that number before. I know. I watched the movie. I know how it ends. And I'm I'm always on the plus. And in this game, I'm not a plus punter. I'm a minus punter, but I'm not as big as I would have been if this was, you know, if the world had told me this was a 25 or 22 handicap. So, yeah, small minus for me are not big. Yeah. Nathan, interesting point Gavin makes about, you know, the big minus handicaps because I tend to get worried about those sometimes as well because I always talk about consolation tries. I'm and just bringing that in, I mean, in this tournament, you get a bonus point for four tries. So if the Warriors run, run in four early tries, job done, they could step off the gas, it could let Cardiff in. As opposed to Super Rugby, where you get a bonus point, if, am I correct in saying three tries more than your opponent? That's which right. Which means the bigger yes. minus is for you a little Better. bit less risky. Yeah, a little bit less ris risky because the chances of a team stepping off the foot off the gas are a little bit less because they don't. And I mean, uh, which was the example? There was an example last week where it happened where um, one of the teams, and I know it cost me money in there, it was the Chiefs, actually. The Chiefs, I had over six and a half Chiefs tries, and with mm -hmm. nine minutes to go, I needed two more tries, and they were 21 points ahead, and they went for posts. And yeah. I actually thought to myself, that has cost me my bet, which it probably did, and I said, I actually hope they concede the bonus point now. And in the end, the opponents actually came back and, 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 and took the bonus point away from them. So, sorry, yeah. bit of a long intro into that one. <laughs> what are your no, thoughts on this <laughs> no, I, I remember it because I was on Chiefs minus 19 and a half. So <laughs> that's, yeah. um, that was a frustrating one. Um, I, I think um, what the Oracle saying in terms of the, the pluses uh, arriving more frequently, and it, it, that's possibly a testament to the fact that the public in general will always back um, favourites and overs yeah. because that's what they like to bet on. So um, Positive you know, bets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, um, it's more fun, I guess. <laughs> Um, it's fun to win as well, of course, but you know that doesn't seem to bother a lot of people. Um, so I, I think that the market tends to be skewed in that direction, um, and it's not always very efficient. I think the rugby markets in general are not very efficient at all, actually, compared to you know major market sports. So, I mean, you, you look probably digressing a little bit. You even look at last week in terms of the the closing line value. Um, you know, closing line across all of the games, and it didn't really matter much in the end. Um, and I think a lot of it is there's a bit of an echo chamber where. You know, everybody's kind of betting the same side 
Now, it's not even clear if there's anybody on the, on the other side at all. So I just think they're not particularly efficient markets. Um, anyway, uh, long story short, so I, I've, um, my model says that this game should be about 20. Um, so I've, I've taken, um, I took Glasgow last night at 15 and a half. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable there. Um, the Warriors have been a team, a good team to bet on all year. They've been, um, you know, consistently beating the cap. So, yep, uh, they, they've got some players back that perhaps weren't expecting Cardiff, um, sort of missing quite a few. So, yep, I think Warriors are the right side. Warriors on the minus there. Nathan, I'm going to stay with you for the next game. Also Friday night, we've got the Ospreys up against Munster. Yeah, the home team of Ospreys have turned in a couple of good performances this season. They're plus six and a half against Munster, coming off some really big wins in their last two starts. Yeah, this is one I'm kind of mulling over a little bit because um, I make the Ospreys the right side. And I think Ospreys have been, a, again, a good team to bet on. I think we've probably mentioned it before, but there's perception that all the Welsh teams are rubbish. Um, Ospreys have kind of bucked that. Like They've tended to, um, I think, overperform, um, outperform the expectations. So my numbers are telling me Ospreys. I'm, I'm sort of just a little bit hesitant, still waiting. Um, I think the number might even move out a little bit further. I have seen some sevens. Um, you know, if I could get a really good number, I think I would take the Ospreys, but that's the side I'd look at. Do you have anything for you in this one? No. So initially when I saw this, I thought um, probably a too low a plus, but after listening to Nathan, no bet. And when I say no bet, and this is, um, this is a message to everybody actually who follows me, I say no bet a lot of times. But 10 minutes into the game, I'm a punter. And I'm sure Nathan and Brent will agree. There's a game that you thought you wouldn't get involved in, but you watched it for 10, 12, 15 minutes, and you're going, all right, I've seen enough. I like this. So I'm going to go into this game unbiased and say no bet at this stage. But I I don't know. It, it looks from a from a price perspective that there's a little bit of value somewhere there it's it almost as if that plus is not big enough and when i see it low low like this a try i yeah and you've given it confidence i i'll wait and see i probably will get involved don't know where though no bet right now well we got to give you the next game you can get involved in here the sharks of course you're, uh, you used to stay in durban there plus one and a half against ulster I mean, how many times, I don't know, I've burnt myself on the Sharks team. I, I don't know. After last week's uh, <laughs> run that I had, I think I have to sit this one out. But I find myself saying, can the Sharks do it? You know, I believe they're going to have a few box back. Can they do it against Ulster, Gavin? You're shaking your head. Absolutely not. Uh, I don't know how many guys are lost, but whatever you've got, I'm not suggesting you dip into Granny's pension here, but let's go slightly short of that and Grandpa's wallet and uh whoever but you can back ulster here this is this is a joke this this sharks team got nothing um i don't care i don't even know how strong this ulster team is but that sharks team has got a big problem they've got a dressing room problem or sh uh, a locker room whatever you want to call it the coach and the and the team are not talking to each other and if they are talking to each other they're not listening properly I, I've done enough money on the Sharks here on handicaps that looked right. I don't give a flying crap what this looks like. I'm on Ulster and not massive. I'm a couple of units here. This is this is a joke. The Sharks are, no, this is value. Minus one and a half Ulster in Durban, which I would have, I would have sworn at you two years ago. I would have told you to get lost. I'm telling you now, get on with someone else's money as well as your money. This is a joke. Ulster will win this game comfortably. There's something wrong at the Sharks. I don't know what it is, but I wouldn't be putting... If you're not sure, if you're not sure, don't have a bet, but don't back the Sharks. Do you, this, is a, this is one of those, the, the red circle with the white cross. Don't have a bet. No bet or Ulster minus. Ulster minus for me. Mark saying Ulster have the Irish internationals back bar Stockdale. But I, I, I want two things. First of all, I want to say, Gav, is this a... You lost a case of beer to me last week. I'm going to... Should we, should we go? Yeah, I'm going Sharks plus one and a half. You got Ulster minus. You want to double Prince, the puts on the case of beer. Friends, ha happily. But I've got to say, you can't you can't keep going with this beer thing. You've got to come to Cape Town and drink the beer with me. It's like you, I can owe you a thousand cases of beer. It doesn't matter. We've got to drink them together. So if you're going to keep back betting beer with me, 
come to Cape Town, we drink it. Let's do a show Thursday night around the fire pit over here. Are we drinking beer while we do it? Why not? Let's go. I'm happy. Ulster Sharks. I'll be we'll do board. We'll do board here. If it's a draw, no bet. If Sharks win, Ulster win. Case of beer is done. Let's go. Two cases. What do you want? One or could, two. I, could, I don't mind. I could could be down there fairly shortly. So you we we hopefully will have a few beers to drink there. Just before I bring Nathan and Walter White saying back the Waratahs Crusades and Sharks in a multiple. Walter, I was thinking about you earlier. I was watching the last episode of Let's Call Saul. What's it? Better Call Saul. Better yeah. Call Saul. I was watching the last one and thinking of, of, of Walter White there. Right. Nathan, are you going to split us on this one, obviously, unless you're going to call a no bet. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sort of the opposite. And I've, I've actually made money betting against the Sharks this year. I remember in the last game um, that I, you know, I, I called it, I think, um, for the Lions. And, um, I, and I think it was, I can't remember if it was you or somebody else was saying, no, no, that this is, the Sharks are finally going to come good. And um, and I knew I'd made the right decision when the lineups came out because I think, you know, Kerwin Bosch was on the bench. They brought in some guy I'd never heard of. It just made me think that maybe they'd kind of quit on the season. And in the same way, in, in the NFL, what they'll tend to do towards the end of the season if they can't win anything is they, they, they like to see what they've got, right? So they bring in, you know, young guys, give them a go, see, you know, are they any good? Uh, I almost get the feeling this is what the Sharks are doing, you know, like that they've just decided, look, we've got no chance of doing anything. Let's just roll the dice on a few things. Let's see what we've got, um, you know, that, that mentally they've kind of checked out. Um, that's probably my concern. I did see a comment pop up here that said that Tosta had their Irish internationals back. So if, if, they, if they come meaning business, you know, that's not good news for the Sharks, I think. So um, I'll, I'll wait till the teams come out again. I think it'll tell you a lot about what the Sharks are thinking. But, um, yeah, I tend to agree with the Oracle. I think there's, there's, there's something wrong. Um, that I, I think they've just quit. Oracle, we could be all square after the weekend there, mate. Right, let's go on to the next game. And I'm going to go with you first here, Nathan. Scarlet's big disappointments this season playing against Benetton. And Scarlet's at home, plus three and a half. Yeah, interesting one. Again, like I've, I've got my numbers in front of me, but they're all based on the teams that ran out last time around, which were missing a bunch of international yeah. players. So um, I have low confidence uh, <laughs> based on the numbers that I've currently got. I really want to see these teams. But, um, but you know, Benetton, they've been good. Um, Scarlets, I think, in general, have been bad. <laughs> so um, uh, that's not a great handicap, but um, I think this is one where I really want to see these teams. Yeah, and it's also fair to say, you know, so many games on the weekend, you know, if there's a game like this where you're not too sure about, even perhaps after seeing teams, there's going to be plenty of other other games to get involved with. But Oracle, are you going to give us something here? Yeah, so I, I, you know what, Brent, as I said to you earlier uh, today or even yesterday, I haven't looked at the handicaps yet. This, um, I wasn't expecting this. I wasn't expecting a plus three and a half scarlet. So this one's caught me quite by surprise. Um, I was going to say at... Um, if the if the uh, Italians were plus three or plus five, I would have said go for it. So again, I'm, I'm a no I'm a no bet uh, punter on this game, but I got to tell you, Scarlets. I'm not going to say they're quite. As, they're not in the same uh, mental camp as the Sharks. But geez, man, you're starting games at plus three and a half at home against the Italians. Something's wrong. I don't know. You don't need to be a rocket scientist here. There's something wrong here. So. Yeah, again, this is a 10 to 15 minute watch game and I'll have a punt on it as well. But right now, this is a confusing handicap. I know I wasn't expecting this at all. Didn't, yeah, didn't, didn't have anything to say about this. It just looks wrong. It looks wrong badly. And then you give me this one. Minus 11 and a half. Stormers against Edinburgh. I'm going to take you to t take the minus with confidence. Um, the weather's great in Cape Town at the moment. The Stormers can, can win this game by 30. You know, what often happens, and this is what Nathan was worried about with the Ulster game and and your mate Mark Dunphy, is you guys all, you know, team worried about how strong the team is that they bring. Well, I can tell you, without even looking, this is a full-strength Thomas team playing in good weather. It hasn't rained in a long time. In fact, we were playing some golf today. Uh, if you weren't wearing a hat, you wouldn't be on the show tonight. You'd have a, a red head brighter than the, the red shirt. It was very hot. It was in the high 30s. Uh, it's very hot. The ground is hard. Um, Stormers win this game comfortably. I, I would be, irrespective of what this Edinburgh team was, I'd be confident taking a minus 11 and a half on the Stormers just based on the fact that it's been good weather. 
the storm storm is in a good place um they are yeah they i'm i'm happy minus 11 just feels too low it should be like again i haven't looked at these handicaps and I, i'm dead honest i have not looked at them i would have thought this would be closer to 20. this looks like a gift to me i won't go and gift uh cash just yet but 11 and a half so i'm i'm getting involved right we'll bring nathan in now i mean if he likes edinburgh strong he might want to have a case of new zealand beer on it with I'm already involved in this one, so um, I've, I've taken the Stormers. I, from from memory, it was um, minus ten and a half, and that, I can't remember off the, exactly what the number was. But um, I've I've seen the news about what Edinburgh are doing in terms of their internationals, so they're, they're all parked this week, coming back next week. Uh, obviously, you know. Not 100% sure what the Stormers are doing, but there's really no reason for them to not have a reasonably strong team. I mean, they've played for a couple of weeks now. So um, my numbers make this with the, the my predicted lineups around about 18. So, yeah, I've, I was all over the Stormers. Well, this could well be one for the Good for the Game newsletter tomorrow. So because I've got a question for you, guys. Yeah. Sorry, from a, math, from a maths point of view, that's a try, mm -hmm. right? 18 off 11. Mm -hmm. Do you go and... Do you look at your computer and your your algorithm and say, "Hmm, this looks like it's it's higher than it should be." In fact, let's ask a question. So, what's the biggest difference from a handicap that your your system has dished out? Has it dished out a seventy three or for thirty two or, or, <laughs> or for two? No, no honestly, you... let's, yeah, let's have a let's have a laugh and a smile. And what are the outrageous stuff that your systems dished out? Because I'm I'm a math sponsor, so I'm enjoying this. When I yeah. see eighteen or eleven, I'm going. Well, that's what I thought about anyway. But it just it just feels percentage wise, it feels too big. Yeah, and so, so there's yeah, a couple of things. Tell us, uh, so, so tell so us a story one, about how big it's gone. On. <laughs> well, I, actually, there's probably yeah. So every now and then you get a, a big outlier, um, and that's just the the, the kind of um, reality of, of working with um, some of these Not machine learning models is that it, it's looking at you know historical data trying to draw up relationships between things there, there may be certain combinations of things that hasn't seen before and it doesn't actually know what to make of it and just comes out with something that's slightly crazy Th those things will always sort of be relatively obvious but I, I think a good example of that was um, when I was generating handicaps and then generating total points and you know, and, and then I would be adding in, okay, you know, there's going to be a lot of rain in this game, or whatever it was. And um, yeah, if you had a decent size handicap and a points total that was that low, it would tell you that a team was going to score negative points. <laughs> exactly. yeah. I'll tell you. So, so, Nathan, so that's an example of where you know you know that it's um, it's yeah. not quite coping. So one of, one of my favourite maths. Um, uh, it's a as, well you'll you'll know when i tell you i use covariance uh, sorry coefficient of variation right so i do a big c a little o and a big v and that's the uh, standard deviation from the uh, from the mean in um you know any any range of of numbers but the reason why i use that quite a lot is to see the stability of what i can expect in other words uh, if, yeah, I punch in a whole lot of data and, I, and I'll look there and I'll say, okay, um, you know, how, how accurate is my prediction here? Yeah. And when I get down to a, a double zero, so 0 0.09 or 0 0.08, it's very, very accurate. So you can, you know, you've got a whole lot of data and you, and you get a COV of 0 0.08, you can go, well, this is going to be a 35-point game or a 42-point game. I haven't applied that to rugby and I'd like to do that because mm. I that you're going to get what you just said a negative a negative mm -hmm. handicap or even a negative points on sorry a negative points on on a game yeah. yes but that, yeah. there obviously are extremes of mass that you won't get in uh in rugby itself and it doesn't know it's like you said it does you know you can only a, a machine will only know what you've punched into it and yeah. now, i was going to ask you as well you obviously weight your uh your current numbers as years go by so in other words you're not looking at something that happened in 2013 and giving it a high weighting so you know if, you, if that's what you're doing then then i'm very yeah. excited yeah correct I mean, and and sometimes to be honest it's actually easier to just chop off like um correct. old seasons so you might say you know anything yeah. that happened in 2012 well 
I just I don't even care about that. That was a different time, different, um, you know, the game was different, um, all of those sorts of things. So you chop that off. And then just talking about the different metrics. So there's probably there's, there's two main metrics that I'm using. So one is judging accuracy using a thing called mean absolute error, which is, you know, how how far wrong, you know, is is the prediction from the actual score. And yeah. then, you know, I will judge my um, uh, error or accuracy against the pinnacle closing line. And then so I'm doing that around accuracy. And then I'm also judging just the against the spread. So like, was I on the right side of the line, um, the, the the pinnacle closing line? And um, in, in general, that accuracy is around about where the pinnacle closing line is. And, and I think the pinnacle closing line would probably be, you know, maybe half a point more accurate than, you know, all the recreational bookmakers, you know, the, the bet three, six, fives of the world. So, so I know it's around about right. But I mean, even even a bookmaker's line, you know, and the sharpest line is you're still talking about somewhere sort of in the ten to twelve range for how far out they were. And if you think about what that means, is that on average they're going to be wrong by about ten points. You know, which is yeah. it, it sounds crazy. It's a huge variation, but it just shows you how random the results can be. You know, so um, and then, so there's two ways that I look at it. So I can say I really want to get my prediction as accurate as it can be, or which is so calibrating it well. Or do I actually want to be, maybe be further out, but I'm on the right side? And for me, I'd rather be on the right side. Like, you know, I, I don't actually care if, um, of course. for example, <laughs> we, we just looked at. Everyone like, wants to be on the right side, Nick. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Like, so, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be um, as close to predicting the game as I can. I want to find an inefficiency in the market where they are not taking account of something, and I am, and I'm on the right side. That's what, you know, obviously far more important for me. Yeah, agreed. I mean, Nathan, just, uh, yeah, interesting to hear that because that's, that's pretty much what I'm looking for when I do the handicaps. And quite often the handicap will move in your direction. Like, let's just take the Blues Crusaders now. I mean, I've predicted nine and a half. That's where the cap is. So I take some sort of uh, solace in the fact that, okay, I, I called that correctly, but it actually means nothing if I don't win <laughs> win on the game type of thing. But, but yeah, you, you've got that. Uh, you've, if you can, I always say if you can, if you can get involved early, and if you if you call the market more often than not, you're going to end up winning. So ultimately, you're going to lose some of them, but you'll you'll probably end up winning. And it takes me, Gavin, to um, there's uh, Bertie um, Compass on the Good for the Game forum, and it, you know uh, that ten to twelve point margin. He, and I know you do this a lot as well. You say don't bother with the nine to ten, take the sixteen to ten, add four or five points, and take the sixteen to ten. And that sort of feeds into the comment there from Nathan that the bookmakers themselves, well. The, the lines themselves are often 10 to 12 points out. It doesn't mean the line's been badly set because if there's a 50-50 split of punters, then the line is well set. But, of course, the, the, it doesn't land there very often, and that's why you like the, the bigger handicaps quite often. Yes, Brent, and, and, and I'll tell you, um, I'm very interested to see what Nathan says about this. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, in the last five years in this industry, I say five, it could be six or seven, I didn't really notice it, but I'm going to tell you, these rugby handicaps are devised by maths students who probably haven't watched a rugby game, uh, haven't had a bet in their lives, and they're sitting somewhere in Switzerland or Germany. So I'll tell you what, if you, you, know, if you really do your numbers and, and you're cleverer than us, you, you've got money to make here because you've got people sitting in Europe setting handicaps for rugby. And not, not only that, they're setting prices for soccer in low leagues, I mean, I, I'll tell you, I've heard stories about how they can move, how, how punters are moving markets in soccer, in, in Caribbean uh, bookmakers, and they're changing the price all over the world. So, yeah, we've got to a, a, a very big machine learning, although I'd like to say the machines are in, in primary school at the moment. They haven't got to high school yet. They never, they're not even close to university, and the clever punters still have an advantage over them, especially where... Uh, non, uh, these countries are dealing with sports that aren't sports to them in their countries. So yes, you know, gone are the days where we sit around a table in Cape Town here, or even Joburg or Durban, where six guys would talk about a handicap of the Bulls game on a Saturday. That's not happening anymore. We we almost sitting around deciding what we, or should I say, discussing what we think the handicap will come out at, and um, you know, making a change. And I remember talking to the one guy at Sport Radar the other day, saying to him. Well, you're allowing me to make a price about a handicap. So the handicap comes in, in this example, at 11. I might want to go uh, 8 to 10 or 7 to 10 uh, Connacht. 
but I can't go 10 and a half or 12 and a half. So that's where punters have got the opportunity or the, the value with them. As bookmakers, a lot of them that are affiliated with the big um, service providers are not able to move that number. They can only move the price. So if you like the 11 or the, you know, or 10, whatever, whatever's on offer, you can have a go because that 11 is not changing, but the price might change. So a lot of punters are betting on number and not price. Well, when I say that, they're not ignoring the price, but they're more conscious of the, the number means more to them than the price. Whereas I'm a, I'd like to say I'm probably a little bit like that where I like a number and I'm going to say, well, over that I'm not having a bet or if it's this number or lower, I'm going to go minus or plus for that matter. So, yeah, Nathan, that's another question to you, uh, having the first conversation with you. I'd like to say I didn't know that I would come to this point, but after talking about it, um, I'm going to say a lot of the time it's the it's the handicap number that has my interest rather than the price. And I know that most of the time it's 9 to 10 or 0.85 as uh, uh, I did an article a few, years, a few years ago, Brent would remember, I said uh, 0.85 is not uh, 9 to 10. Um, but I have a minimum on rugby at 7 to 10, so 1.7 in your in your numbers. Uh, so um, I won't go lower than that. 0.69, you'd have to twist my arm. But honestly, 0. 0.7, I don't go lower than that in, in, in a straight bet on rugby. So, yeah, I do take the 0. 0.83s and the 0. 0.85s, but it's about the number for me. Not mm. the is, – is betting's always about price, but when it comes to handicaps, I feel better at a number, at an actual number. And in this case, I'm going to tell you, I don't know what to do here. It looks <laughs> wrong. <laughs> it, it looks wrong. It's to a me new well. record for longest intro into a game. Yeah, no yeah. So, 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 hundred record now, and a lot of people know I'm a, I'm a line supporter, and I wear my line shirt most Saturdays, and I go buy my biltong and whatever. But I don't think they the lines aren't winning this game. It'd be great if they did, but I don't think they are. And I will have a little bit of a bet at a plus, but it will be a a, a patriotic punt. I don't know what to do at eleven off. It feels right. I don't. I'm not having a. I'm not having a punt yet. It's a patriotic punt only, and um, and I'd like the Lions to do well, but I I think they get beaten here yeah, comfortably, and comfortably could be. I wouldn't be surprised if they get beaten by 20, and I also wouldn't be surprised if they get beaten by seven or eight. So, yeah, it's a patriotic punt for me. Don't take any notice of it. I don't know what to do here. Right. Oracle saying, don't take any notice of him. I think he only means for that game, though. Right, Nathan, yes. what have you got for us? <laughs> what have you got? I must say, I haven't uh, – yeah, as I said, this is a quiet weekend for me, but looking at this, Nathan, for me, uh, I'm leaning towards the home team. Yeah. Uh, I kind of feel the opposite, really. So the Lions have been a really good team to me this year to back. Probably, probably well, along with the Ospreys and, and the Warriors, the, the best team. Like, and I think what it's telling me is that, like, I've got in terms of model numbers, probably a pretty good read on these teams. And I, th this number is is implying to me that the Lions are sending a B team and they kind of have got all of their Irish internationals back. If that's true, then I'd need to rerun things, but. The, uh, Things as they stand, uh, I fancy the Lions here. But um, so then it just tells me I must be missing something. You know, maybe there's some news out there that's saying that the Lions are, uh, you know, sending the reserves or something. I'll have to hunt around to look. But um, based on what I know now, I'd, I'd, I'd probably have a, have, a, have a crack at the Lions. Um, I'm well, doubling my crazy. bet. I'm doubling my bet from small to medium on the back of what just Nathan just said. I'm very impressed, Nathan. I, uh, if the Lions win here, I shall send you a Lion shirt in the post. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Mark Dumpty can tell you all about sending shirts to South Africa in the post. He's had a few real headaches getting me some Leinster shirts. And he's just making the point, Lions have taken three planes to Ireland in 25. So those are also the, the little subtle things uh, we've got to look at in the betting, you know, things like uh, travel weariness and stuff. Kind of hard to be at home. So Mark, I think coming out on my side here on the kind of minus We've still got, uh, what, two games left to go, gents? Um, and I'm going to start off with you, Nathan, with a, a penultimate game. We've got South African team Bulls away to the Dragons. Dragons second last on the on the table, just above the Sharks. And we've got a plus 10 and a half here with the Blue Bulls firm favourites. Yeah, it feels like it maybe a bit of a banana skin, but um, my numbers are telling me Bulls. So, again, need to look at the lineup, But, um, yeah, 
can't, I can't tell you much more beyond that because, as I said, it's all kind of based on um, previous lineups. So I need to see. And I, we've talked about this before: is that you know often the the teams they they send a message of their intent, you know, how up for a game they are by their selections. So uh, I, I really want to see what the Bulls are thinking here. Yeah, team news. Of course, the nice thing about the Super Rugby is we've got all the team news where we do the show. Unfortunately, with the URC, we sometimes have the Friday team news, but uh, not always the Saturday and the Sunday. Gav, what do you think of this one? Bulls minus 10.5. Mark reckons it's the Bulls all day. He says the Dragons are just so bad. And I would be nodding my head at that as well. Um, I'm going to tell you, you can take minus 24.5 with confidence here. This is, uh, <laughs> this is a double try out. Mathematically, this is completely wrong. The first number being a one tells me straight away it's wrong. Um, Jake White, everything about this Bulls team. I think they've beaten every – I stand to be corrected, Brent, including the couple of Lions games they've played. I think they've beaten every handicap uh, in the last five or six games. This is a, this looks like a computer printout number to me, and someone hasn't thought about it properly. Um, I, I, I'm expecting 20-plus here, honestly. I'm, I think they're 10 points out, minimum. 10 points out. This is better of the week. Better of the week Both. from the, the Oracle. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Both. Sorry, Nathan. That's anything it. else from your side? Uh, no, no, I, I agree. Like the number I've got in front of me is probably, you know, something in that 19, 20 range. Right. So a couple of nice, you know, we've had a few games which are a little bit uncertain. In other words, we go in different directions, but the two of you are very nicely on the line on a couple of them as well. And Gavin, I'm going to ask you to um, start the last game off by us. We've got Zebra here. Plus 19 and a half against Leinster. Once again, you know, team news for me will be important here. Are Zebra getting any of the internationals back? Are Leinster getting any of their internationals back? But you're not a team news man particularly. What does this handicap tell you? What do the numbers tell you, Gav? Well, my son said to me when he saw this, he said to me, like, do Zebra, do Zebra know when they go on the field that they're going to be thumped? And I said to him, but how do you know they're going to be thumped? He said, well, they're playing Leinster. I said to him, but... Yeah, what happens if Leinster send their, you know, D, D.5 E team over? He says Zebra must know they're going to get thumped. Um, I'm going to say on the back of the Italian result, which I uh, um, I called uh, correctly last week. In fact, I'd like to say I called it nicely last week. Um, I, did, I don't think I gave enough. I tried to uh, during your show last week, Brent. I tried to tell the public at least six times. And Italy were going to win that game. And um, I loved it. It was great. And I don't know if these if the Italian – I don't even know how many of the Italian teams play players play for Zebra because I'm not a players uh, a punter. I've never really known the players. And I'm okay with that. I don't need to be educated or taken into the um, 2020s and 2030s. Uh, I'm okay not knowing who the players are. Um but this has got to be good news for, for Italy. And again, I didn't know what to expect with the handicaps. I was thinking maybe maybe eight or ten. I'm going to tell you at 19 and a half, get on the Artas here, as we call them in Joburg. And I haven't heard that word in Cape Town. But the Artas in Joburg, get on the Artas here. This is plus 19 and a half. It's too many points. And you know what? If you lose, that's okay. Don't go massive. But... I'm, this is too big. This feels too big mathematically. And after last week's Italian win, I'm on the Artas here, plus 20 and a half, 19 and a half, 18. I'll even say plus 15 and a half sounds too big to me. So, yes, I'm, I'm on the Italians here. Well, Mark Dunphy, who's a big lens to supporter, I can tell you, is coming in and agreeing with you there and saying a, a zebra on the plus. But let's give Nathan the final word. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be very helpful here because I've got, um, without getting too technical, um, sort of a, a, a blend of different algorithms, one that's sort of based on a kind of linear regression, another one which is based on neural networks. They're split. They're on either side of this number. Um, so right now, I as I said, can't, can't help you. I don't have a clear view. No, no problem. James, that brings us to the end of the show. Uh, certainly was, uh, I can confidently say, the longest handicap show, but I think some very interesting chats in there and hopefully some cracking bets for the weekend as well. Um, and time to get into the best bets now. And, and Gavin, we'll start with you. What are your two or three best bets on the cards? I know, Bulls Minus by Country Mile. Um, if you have one bet this weekend, Bulls Minus, race over, done. 
finish. Pay the public, Over. says the oracle. And, and sorry, uh, and uh, if you let's go, let's go further. A double, I'd say chuck in the uh, Ulster. So bulls onto Ulster. And if you want to treble, uh, keep it a little bit low, but yeah, take the two and chuck on uh, on the eye ties at the end there. And Jason Denman Most coming in. UFC Cameron Simon, of course, the South African at 14 to 10. And there is a, a discussion forum thread open now, uh, thanks to Jason and a couple of other punters on the Good for the Game forum. So if you like your UFC, follow that for a tip. How's as it, as it, Jason? We get close to big fights. And uh, now, Nathan, your best bets, maybe uh, give us a Super Rugby and a URC or a couple in each, whatever you want. Yeah, in the URC, uh, Stormers. I'll take the Stormers um, over Edinburgh. Uh, and then, yeah, and then in uh, in Super Rugby, uh, uh, the Highlanders. Take the Highlanders plus against the Chiefs. Right, Highlanders plus the Super Rugby best bet. Great, man. That brings us to the end of the show. Thanks to all the guys who commented in the live chat um and uh, your contributions always appreciated and then nathan thanks a lot mate uh, what's the rest of the day hold for you oh i've got to start work now so <laughs> i feel like i've worked half a day already <laughs> that's okay, why i did it feels so different wow <laughs> and oracle for you mate uh, is it off to is it off to bed no uh, it's only 10 o'clock and i oh, and i took leave tomorrow which we always do or i say we I always do. Public holiday tomorrow. I always take the Friday. If the public holiday is on Tuesday, take the Monday. Make a long weekend. I'm I'm seeing a friend of mine that used to work with me a few years ago. Um, I'm seeing her for lunch or a coffee tomorrow. And then uh, I've got another mate of mine from Durban's out here in Cape Town with some English dude. They're trying to sell me something. Uh, it's three o'clock. I'm going to have a beer or two. Um, so, yeah, my wife's unhappy because she's going to work. Um, so I'm going to get out of bed quite late. And that's still a long time from now. Friday morning is literally, like, I don't know, like that's 10 hours away. We so, yeah, we know, it's, it's crazy. It's a, it's a lot shorter from now than when we started the show, I must tell you. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it's more beer and, uh, and, uh, I'm not going to get punting racing. It's fair view tomorrow. So I, I, I generally stay away from that. So I won't have any. Uh, racing stuff but yeah i'll watch some of the super rugby tomorrow i'm looking forward to it i'll have a couple of punts they won't be very big but i will and um yeah otherwise uh no i'm off tomorrow so no work for me on friday excellent thanks james thanks very much thanks uh, everyone else for watching we'll be back next week probably with the two shows um i, I had to we had to change it this week just because of my schedule i was away last night in pretoria watching some varsity rugby and, uh, yeah, we'll be back next week with the two shows, and certainly there'll be the Handicap Rugby Chat that matters at 9 o'clock on Thursday. Thanks, everyone.